Perfect. We are officially recording. Thank you, everybody, so much for joining us this evening. Um, I see that there is about just over 20 of us um, who are on right now, and I know that people are going to come and go uh, as we chat. And we usually find in the next 15 or 20 minutes, we'll find that a few more people are able to trickle in. So as I said, my name is Catherine Connors. Uh, I work for the organization Adopt for Life. I'm the team lead, one of the team leads with the organization. I am so grateful to be here with these wonderful ladies who are going to be my co-hosts for this evening. So we have Darcy, uh, who I hopefully you'll see in the middle. She's in the middle screen for me at least. Um, she is a, I hope I'm saying this, a recruiter uh, with the Wendy's Wonderful Kids program through the Dave Thomas Foundation. Um, Darcy, she comes with a, a wealth of knowledge and Holds a special place in my heart personally as Darcy actually helped me um, and supported our family when we adopted our children. So I'm very biased when it comes to Darcy and her amazing, amazing work and everything that she does. And of course, we have Valerie and Priscilla who are here. And these lovely ladies are our expert uh, panelists who are... <laughs> so ask all the questions directed to them too and not us. No, I'm joking. Um, they're here to help guide us and provide insight um, on lived experience with older youth adoption and be able to guide us and help uh, answer questions that you might have. Before we kind of get into the meat and the potatoes of the presentation, I do want to kind of just do a little bit of, I guess, housekeeping rules about how to use Zoom technology. I know that some of you might be new to this. Some of you might have seen many videos that we have done. Um, so I just want to make sure that you know how to participate, how to ask a question, if there are any tech issues, what it is that you can do to alert us. So as I'm sure you've heard me say a few times, we cannot see or hear you, so you don't need to worry about any background noise um, or what's going on in your household. Um, as we talk, we do want this to be as interactive as possible, so please feel free to add to the discussion, ask questions, share insights, and maybe if you have some life experience that you'd like to share, we'd love to hear from you. In order to do that, there's actually two ways. So the first one is actually using the chat function. So by clicking the chat feature, you're able to um, identify yourself and ask a question, share, add to the conversation. If you do have a specific question that you wanna ask um, one of us specifically, you are able to ask someone privately a question. So what that means is the drop down menu, all you need to do is search for our names and you're able to direct a question specifically at one of us. For this webinar specifically, I'm asking if you could direct all private questions to me, just because one of my roles is going to be um, to help run, um, run the webinar itself and make sure that these lovely ladies have the ability to just focus on the presentation and sharing information. So if you do have a question, please, um, that you don't want to share or you want to be anonymous, please feel free to direct it at me. Um, the other option, as you see on your screen, is the Q&A. That's a, a section that you're able to use if you want to ask a question specifically on what we're talking about, or if you feel that we haven't addressed a specific subject, um, feel free to pop it in the Q&A section. You can do that either anonymously or as well with using your name. As I read the questions, I will not be using your full name. I might refer to you as your first name, just so that everybody is aware we do record these videos. It is something that is going to be um, put on our, our YouTube channel. So please just to be aware uh, when you're sharing information and confidentiality to be able to um, just be mindful of the information that you're sharing and, and identifying information. We wanna be respectful of everyone's journeys and where they are. So those are the two things. If you do find there's a tech issue, um, if we're talking too fast, if you can't hear us, uh, if we're mumbling, if you missed something and that you think is really important, please feel free to use the raise hand button. And that's just a way really, it's just gonna flash on our screen, the kind of a light's gonna flash on our screen and that's gonna be a signal to me to stop the presentation and make sure we address something. I myself tend to speak very fast. So if you're thinking that I'm talking too fast, raise your hand and let me know. Or if you're feeling that you need something repeated, please raise your hand as well. Um, to let you know, I do have three young children and they are all awake. Um, so I hope that we don't get any guest appearances. But I mean, for those of you who are parents, this, this is just reality. This is life of being a parent. Uh, and I see we have a guest appearance of a dog for uh, Valerie and Priscilla, which is awesome. 
the joys of being at home, right? Um, so just so you know that there might be some disruption and we're going to try our best um, to be able to make this as smooth as possible. But this is a warning. Uh, we have had my three-year-old come in to do a rendition of Three Little Ducks uh, a couple webinars <laughs> ago. Uh, yeah. So uh, anytime, so don't perfect. Worry. There we go. So you just never know what's going to happen. So that being said, um, I don't know, um, some of the people who I'm seeing are new names. So if everyone is okay, I just want to take one minute to introduce who I am a little bit more, my connection to adoption. And then I'm going to um, give the floor over to Darcy to introduce herself as well as Priscilla and Valerie, just so you know who we are and uh, why you should be listening to us. So like I said, my name is Catherine and I've been a part of Adopt for Life for just uh, almost two years now, just over two years now. Um, and so my role has recently changed to, to be supporting the regions. And so we support adoptive families and families who've been touched by adoption um, all over Ontario. So that's including kinship, foster care, or, or fostering families. Um, adoptees, birth families, professionals, just anyone who really has been touched within the ado adoption journey. And so our role is to be able to provide resources, supports, advocacy to families, uh, and really make sure that the education is out there. So I, as I mentioned, I have three young children. They are now eight, six, and three, adopted through the foster care system, and they were three and a half, 15 months and birth when they came to me, I'm trying to remember. And so I've been a parent for about five, just over five years now. Um, so I'm very excited. This is such a, a much needed webinar and I know that um, this is going to be a lot of information. So everybody who is watching, please know that we are recording and you will be sent a copy as well. So I'm gonna stop talking because I can, talk all evening about myself. So Darcy, do you want to briefly introduce yourself? All right. Thanks, Catherine. And uh, you hold a special place in my heart as well. Um, and welcome everyone on uh, today's presentation on um, your older youth adoption. Um, I'm really excited to share a lot of information about child welfare permanency plans through adoption or legal custody. And also the Wendy's Wonderful Kids um, program. So bear with me because I have a lot of information for you all. So Catherine and uh, Valerie and Priscilla, please interject um, if uh, you have something to say, um, please. Um, but I've been working in child welfare for 23 years and um, over the last eight years I have been a Wendy's Wonderful Kids um, recruiter. And I'm really proud to say that at Windsor Essex, um, we have found families for over 45 WW kids. So I think that's a, a quite a high rate and great success. Um, and um, as a child protection social worker, um, um, we received the grant from the Dave Thomas Foundation, and um, that allows us to um, have this special role um, in our adoption uh, department. So we work with children that um, are kind of at risk of uh, aging out of care. Um, and uh, so the specific groups, just quickly, that I work with um, are um, children that are older. And when we say older, we're going to say about eight years of age and larger sibling groups. Um, I also work um, with children with extensive trauma histories and um, children that are medically fragile. Those are the four groups that I work with, and th those are the Wendy's Wonderful Kids. So those are the children that are actually waiting in care um, and are growing up in care. And we haven't been able to find a kinship connection or a local um, recruited family for them. So that's why they're on my caseload, and that's why I work um, very closely um, with them so that uh, I can search for their forever family. Perfect. And Valerie and Priscilla, do you guys mind introducing yourselves to the lovely audience we have? Mm -hmm. So, oh. <laughs> do you want to look at sure. okay. um, I'm Valerie, and I adopted Priscilla uh, just after her 15th birthday, and she's 16 now. We've been a family for almost 18 months, and we're just waiting to finalize our adoption. Yeah. <laughs> my name is Priscilla. Um, um, as my mom mentioned, I've been with her for almost 18 months. Um, it's been great. So. 
<laughs> I'm just having a little bit of a hard time hearing you guys. You seem to be a little bit soft. I don't know if it's just okay. me. So just to let you know if you don't mind just speaking up a little bit, if that's okay. I, it might just be my computer, though. Is uh, enough? Yes, that's better. Perfect. Okay, so if you guys are good, we can start into the slide. Does that work for you, Darcy? Yes, that's great. Okay. I'm just going to mute myself because I have a little one running around here. Okay. Okay, so we can go to the next slide. We'll talk about the foundation. Um, well, we all know Dave Thomas. He's the founder of the Wendy's Restaurants, and um, he actually is an adoptee. And he had a wonderful um, childhood and a wonderful adoptive family. And um, when he was an adult and he realized of all the children that were waiting in foster care, he became um, very passionate about finding forever families for all those children. Um, it was his vision um, to ensure that um, every child was raised in a forever permanent home. Um, and he really truly believed that it was, um, that these children are our responsibility. And he really took that personally. So he developed the Wendy's Wonderful Kids Signature Program. And that was over 25 years ago. Um, the head office is in Columbus, Ohio. And so um, it's close to Windsor. And uh, in 2006, that's when um, the foundation decided to expand um, out of the United States and come to Canada. And um, we're lucky in Windsor that we received the grant in 2007. Okay. Oh, sorry, I just had to unmute. So it looks like someone just commented that we do have um, um, someone who is watching who's also a recruiter for families for older children, an adoptive father of a sibling group of three, and runs support groups. That's amazing. Fantastic. You're welcome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So the Dave Thomas Foundation, the mission is dramatically increase the number of adoptions in um, North America. And the belief is that every child deserves a safe, loving, and permanent family, and that no child should linger in foster care. Um, and that's really important, um, that every child is adoptable. And that's the, uh, that view is the foundation that we work upon, that every single child, um, regardless of their need or their age or you know, what they've been through in their young lives, um, every single child's adoptable. And we've come a long way from, you know, just having infant adoptions. Um, so we work really hard with, um, with that task and that mission. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. I did try to drop the, I know we had talked about dropping the actual video in here, but it yep. turns out I'm really not tech friendly. So I'm gonna hope that this is gonna work for everybody. Okay, so yeah, and the video, this is the unadoptable is unacceptable video created by the Dave Thomas Foundation. So it's a really good overview of my program and what exactly I do with the children. Perfect. So I hope this is going to work. I might need to stop sharing and then reshare. I just want to make sure that maybe I'll do that now just to make sure that everybody can see um, what I'm doing. So just give me, bear with me, everybody, just one second. You'll see a big pop up of our faces. Okay, I'm just going to reshare my screen. Okay, so now we should be able to watch it. Oh, gosh. Oh, something's happening. Okay, here we go. Please let me know if you guys can't see this.
This really gets me every time. I don't know how many times I've seen it. It still gets me. It's beautiful. Well, thank you, Catherine. I'm glad it worked. I love that video. And I, I, I know it, it is uh, emotional. Um, but I think it's a really good overview of what the Wendy's Wonderful Kids, uh, what the workers actually do. Um, so we work from um, a model, and it's called the uh, Child Focus Recruitment Model. And we all um, adhere to this uh, it's a proven um, model and um, we base a lot of our research from um, implementing this and we always measure our outcomes to make sure that what we're doing is really meaningful. So we do take on smaller caseloads um, so that we can spend um, the time implementing this, this program. Um, so the first thing we do um, is we, we start to um, look at the file. We do a in-depth case record review. So we look at the whole, the child's, all their files, because um, we're looking for connections for children. That's our really key area. For kin, for, um, you know, it could be a teacher in their past that they had a significant relationship with. Um, it could be a coach, um, a previous foster parent, a neighbor. Um, so we're just trying to collect who was important to this child. Um, and so that's part of the di diligent search and the case record review. Um, we have a very close relationship with the child. We actually visit them um, as much as we can, but mostly on a, on a monthly basis to really get to know who they are and um, not just who they are on paper, right? Because we've been through the file and we do have that information, but we want to know the essence of the child. We want to know their wishes and their, their feelings about who they are and what you know their views are about the future and and uh, their future goals so we really have that um we really develop that one-to-one -one relationship so that the child can learn to trust the relationship and then to begin to um trust the process of adoption and and um, trusting other adults in their life um we also through the whole process we do an ongoing assessment of uh, the child's adoption readiness and when they're ready to move forward in the process. Um, so it kind of helps us gauge when it, we're in that position to secure families for them um, because they have to be ready. Um, yeah, and network building, that's something that's really important because we work with so many people um, that's involved in the child's circle and, and, you know, children are living in foster homes or they're living in OPRs. And so uh, we speak to those um, care providers all the time um, to know how the child's doing. But we also teach them what adoption means or what permanency means through legal custody and um, how to talk about permanency. Um, some people don't know, and, and that's okay. We're here um, as a resource, as a consultant to um, people in the child's network. So Wendy's Wonderful Kids really, um, they provide that information and knowledge and um, support the child so closely um, in order to find their forever family. And I know that for us and our, our children by no means were older uh, when mm -hmm. we adopted them, but uh, our oldest serenity has some pretty uh, complex uh, special needs and as a parent who's adopted through the Wendy's Wonderful Kids program, we felt supported throughout the entire process as well. So we felt that we were getting the resources we understood because Darcy and her, like the team understood our daughter's needs. We felt prepared in that we were comfortable in asking the questions and making sure that the resources and the support was there. And um, I think that's really important with any type of adoption. We do have a question that just popped up. Yep. No. Oh, what are OPRs? Good question. I don't know that answer. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's oh, um, outside paid resources. Oh. So the children, uh, my the children that I work with in Windsor Essex are in my jurisdiction, um, but there are some children that have to move out of my area in order to um, to have services or to have that right home for them. So a few of my Wendy's wonderful kids, they are you know they might live closer to Toronto. So I would go there and visit them and, um, and speak to um, you know, their care providers. So it's an outside paid resource. So it could be like a, um, a foster home um, for another, like in another like agency outside of my jurisdiction. And we have them all across Ontario. We ideally would love to have our kids in our jurisdiction, um, but sometimes they, res they require the resources that we just don't have here. Um, so that's what it means. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, this is the, so the Dave Thomas Foundation, we do research all the time to make sure that our program is working and um, it has, and it does work. Um, so this is just some research findings that when we implement this model, we're 1.7 times more likely to, the children are more likely to be adopted when um, compared to those that are not served by this program. Um, for older tooth, true um, children, for sorry, for older children, the impact is um, much greater. Um, for children referred to our program at the age of eight, the likelihood of adoption was one and a half times higher. And children referred at 11, the likelihood was two times higher. And for children referred at 15, the likelihood was three times higher. Um, and children with mental health disorders, three times more likely to be adopted. And that's really because of the, the child-focused recruitment model, because we can work so closely with the child that um, you know, we, can, we can share information to families about who the child really is, not just about what their, pay, their previous assessments read or you know, um, kind of uh, what their experiences were in the past. And re we're really able to see what the child's like here and now and how they've healed in foster care or how they've um, you know, been able to um, move through their developmental trauma and they're in a really good place to um, move forward into a forever family. And also it's about the Wendy's Wonderful Kids helping the children realize that yes, they can be adopted and that there are families there that want them and um, will love them um, forever. So that's why the model really works. And we do have a question. So uh, will we be discussing strategies to recruit families for older youth, especially teens? That's where we're having our biggest barriers to permanency. And I think we will be discussing um, um, unique um, qualities that, that families, that you look for in families. Is that, I believe we do have a couple slides on that. Yeah. So hopefully that will be able to um, answer some of the questions, at least, that you have as far as recruitment goes. Yeah, it's a little bit further down in the presentation, yeah. but we, you know, there's, we can always talk privately, too, about that for your recruitment. Okay. Okay. Yep, so um, we implement the model, the child-focused recruitment model. Um, our roles can vary a little bit across the province, um, but um, we're, we always implement the same kind of strategies in working with children. Um, we also see ourselves as, I would say, experts in breaking down barriers to permanency. Um, you know, we work really closely with foster parents. We have a high level of success with foster parents adopting the children that they're caring for. And um, sometimes we, um, when we're having those discussions with foster parents or connections with the children, um, there or even with um, recruited families, there's a lot of barriers. Um, there's the fear of um, certain diagnoses, or there's the fear of lack of resources or finances to <clears throat> help the child with a, with a specific need. So we're there to, as recruiters, to make sure that we put the puzzle together and that we try to. Um, ensure that um, whatever the barrier is that we try to break it down and um, provide the services to mitigate that barrier. Um, so also one thing that we do is if we feel that the child um, does need a particular resource um, or an assessment, that's something that we can really champion and um, we can request. We work so closely with the child and care workers um, and uh, it's a wonderful partnership. So um, usually when we recommend something, um, you know, it, it's appreciated and it's acted upon quite quickly. Um, and something we do ongoing through all of our work with the child is that we're always looking at kin, kin connections and, um, and uh, you know, go through the file ongoing to see how we can nurture these relationships. And we also um, prepare, we've talked about this already, but we pre prepare others for adoption and legal custody. And it could be even a therapist. They might not be, um, they might not know a lot about trauma history or adoption through child welfare um, and some of the intricacies there. So we are definitely um, prepared and are able to provide that information to um, all the key um, stakeholders that work with um, within the child care team. Okay. So yeah, so 
Recruiter, yeah. So how do uh, recruiters find families for children? We talked about that one-to-one -one relationship. That is probably, for me, the most significant um, part of the model is that one-to-one -one relationship. Um, because I'm going to be with this child for the whole duration until the finalization happens. That's what the recruiter does. They work um, closely um, with the child care team un until we reach finalization. We kind of champion and move the adoption along and, like I said, break down barriers so we can continue to um, move towards that finalization. Um, we do a lot of mobility mapping or genograms or eco maps. Um, we do lots of activities with children, um, little like treasure boxes with like or heart boxes, I guess, um, where we put feelings in or wishes in, um, life books. We do all of these things to help prepare children. Um, we do recruitment plans. We all write a recruitment plan for a child, so it's very meaningful and purposeful what we do. Um, and we attend all the meetings um, at the Children's Aid Society. We can go to the schools and attend meetings, and um, we can even go to the doctor if we have to. We're really there to make sure we know all about the child so we can provide information to families. That's like firsthand information and relevant information because we want these adoptions to work lifelong, so we have to provide all the information so parents feel prepared and that this is the right match. Um, so we also champion uh, permanency um, and the urgency around permanency because we don't want children to wait in foster care. We want them to find permanency as soon as they can um, and because we, we truly believe that children heal when um, they're in secure and safe relationships. Okay, so role of the adoption worker. So, um, like I said, I'm in the adoption uh, team, and um, this will vary across the province, but the real difference between a Wendy's Wonderful Kids recruiter and adoption worker is that uh, we, um, we work with the children when there's no match, when there's no um, plan for the child. We know that we want this child to be um, in a permanent pl place through legal custody or adoption, but um, it hasn't happened. So we have to really work hard to um, find um, the family for that particular child. So once we actually find the match and find the family, that's when um, an adoption worker will then be assigned and then they'll start the process of um, disclosure and they'll start the transition schedule and they complete the um, court um, package um, for finalization. So that's what the adoption placement workers do and that does vary um, across the province. Sometimes the WWK worker will um, even you know, do the disclosure meetings and transition the children and then the adoption workers will do the finalization package. So um, where are the Ontario CAS WWK recruiters? Well, um, they're all over the place, thank goodness. Um, we have 24 WWK recruiters in Ontario, and I think that's amazing because we really need that skill set to help um, the other adoption workers and the child and care workers um, secure that um, permanent family for the child. Um, we have 24 locations across Canada in eight provinces, and we're, we're scaling up. We still we want to um, um, increase that number as well. And across North America, 400 um, recruiters. And it's pretty amazing. We all get together um, once a year in Columbus, and uh, we're there to train and learn how to improve our recruitment skills and um, connect um, families with children. Perfect. And what I'll, what I'll do, Darcy, is that when I'm sending, I just want to also be, just be conscious of our time. So when I send out a copy of this webinar, the link right here that, that lists where the recruiters are, I'll include that, the link as well, so that if anyone wants to view to see where they might be close to them, they'll be able to see it, if, if that's okay with you. No, that's perfect. That's perfect. Okay. okay. Yeah. And it'll have all our information, our telephone numbers, our email addresses. So yeah, please, um, that would be great, Catherine. Perfect. So yeah, you can call us at any time. Um, we're always here for um, questions or consultations. Um, you can, I would really encourage you to go on the um, Dave Thomas Foundation um, for Adoption website because there's a lot of really good information. There's um, blogs and um, there, there's just um, a host of resources there for you. And um, 
yeah, I would really encourage um, you to go on that site, just like I would with Adopt for Life and Adoption Council of Ontario and Adoption Council of Canada. Um, yeah, you can, and you can send us your profiles if you have, um, if you want to. Um, and I'm always accepting of them from my jurisdiction because it, and you'd have to really focus on your, your, your parameters and highlight your skills and your interests and uh, your special talents. Or if you have any special training, um, you know, or you're parenting a child with, um, you know, uh, you know, exceptionality, those are the things we're looking at because our, our kids, like I explained in the beginning, um, you know, they have some very unique histories and um, we really want to make sure that we have the best families for them. So you can always send in your profiles. Um, never um, hesitate to reach out. Um, and another thing is that we're having the Adoption Resource Exchange on Sunday. Yeah. You can come out, if you've registered, you can come out. Um, most of the recruiters will be there in Ontario. Um, or so significant you'll be of, there, Darcy. I will be there, yes. Uh, so you can hand, you, hand me your... Oh, yeah, both of you, will be, all of us will be there. That's right. Excellent. So, <laughs> and, and the Adopt for Life Resources Village. That's right. I was just yeah. writing your names down. How, how could I even forget? <laughs> how could you? <laughs> how could I forget? Um, and we do have a question. So do you collaborate with each other? So with other WW, WWK recruiters if a family is in a different region but could be matched for one of your other children I know I can answer that with yes <laughs> because I live in Peel region and Darcy and my children were living in the Windsor ex Essex region so we were able to collaborate um, in, and I know in my region um, we had originally um, connected with the uh, WWK recruiter in Toronto I think it's Naomi, I believe is her name. I could be wrong. Um, and so through there, we were able to also connect with you um, at the ARE. So mm -hmm. I know it's something that you guys are able to help network. Yeah, and we do. We network closely. Every um, month we have a, a call and we talk to each other and uh, we provide support to one another. But um, absolutely, if I'm looking for a family for one of my uh, children, um, with has a, a you know a, a certain need then I will definitely reach out and say this is what I'm looking for do you have a family in your jurisdiction that could um, provide for my child and uh, it would be a good match so yeah we work so closely together mm -hmm. and the other thing about the um, the ARES it's there's regional ARES as well now and so that would be something that you should really um, look for and uh, do some research around because it, across Ontario we do regional ones and then twice a year we do provincial ones um, so it's just something to um, think about and the resource village just like um, Valerie and Priscilla we're going to be there and Catherine the resource villages are brilliant um, I don't know if you're going to talk about that Catherine or <laughs> absolutely I hope that we can we're um we did provide for those of you who are interested in learning more and getting kind of prepared for the area because as an awaiting parent it can be absolutely overwhelming um and very overstimulating and there's a lot of information we actually um hosted a webinar a few weeks ago on how to prepare for the area so if anyone's watching this and they do want a copy um, or are interested in learning more about what the area is or what you can do to prepare how to register, we collaborated with Adopt Ontario, um, who's a part of the ACO who actually hosts and runs the entire um, event. Um, so please feel free to message me or when I email a copy of this webinar out to you, please feel free to respond to me in the email to ask for a copy of the other one as well. Um, okay. Okay. So you may be wondering again who um, are our WW kids. I did talk to you about the four main categories, but um, some statistics from the Dave Thomas um, Association from this year. 90% um, are older than the age of eight. And so this is looking at all of our caseloads and the children that we're serving. 33% um, 33, 33 had six or more placements. So that's six or more foster move, foster placement placement or OPR moves. Um, so there's a lot of loss history there, um, lots of changes. 52% have been in foster care for more than four years, okay? Um, and that could be um, while we were in court as well um, and uh, working very closely with the family to try to, you know, 
enhance the, the, the strength of the family, um, because that's always our goal in child protection is to work strongly and um, closely with the birth family to lower the risk to return children back home. But sometimes that just doesn't happen. Um, and so a judge makes an order of extended um, society care and, um, and there's time scales on that too. Um, we have to, children can't just drift in care while um, we're working with birth parents. There's um, legislation about how long we can wait for until we have to um, make a decision about um, extended society care. So just so you know, extended society care means that um, the Children's Aid Society um, is now, um, well, the crown is the parent of the child. We have removed parental rights and we are now in a position of a guardian for the child. So those are the children that are available for adoption. They all have um, the extended society care um, status. And I think um, that was formally referred to as crown wardship or yeah. crown ward, which we've realized is um, not an appropriate term. And so the new, with the new CYFSA, I think that's what the change was. Is that right? Is that it's now called extended society care? For yes. That's wondering. Yeah, that's exactly right. The new act, and I did talk about this later, but the new act came into, um, uh, was effective in April of this year. And so, yes, the language was very important in, um, in the change of legislation. And we listened to the, the youth voices. And that was one something that they really spoke about was the, the language in the legislation. So Crown Ward, we don't use anymore. So it's extended society care. Mm -hmm. And we talked about where they're living. And so we work with children of all ages, cultures, race, and religion. Mm -hmm. So some of the reasons why children come into care, um, and this is from the Ontario Association of Children's Aid Society. Um, it's from 2014 to 15, so it's a, the most recent stat that I could find on the site. But um, the reason why we work with, with families um, is for requests for assistance, um, for support. Um, children exposed to parental um, violence, so domestic violence, um, caregiver with a problem. So that could be you know, mental health or it could be addictions. Um, and then also physical force or maltreatment and inadequate supervision. So those are um, some of the reasons um, we see at high frequencies why we're involved with families. Um, so youth aged 16 to 18 are the highest represented age group in care. And um, this stat here, when it talks about 36% of adoptions were by foster fam family the child has been living with, I have to say that it's actually increased. It's a lot more now. Um, and we're really grateful for that because that's where the children are living. And, um, you know, they have that attachment and, um, you know, they've worked with the birth parents. And when there's openness in older adoption, which majority of um, um, adoptions do have openness um, attached, um, the foster families have that relationship already. So there's a comfort level. Um, so for Windsor, for example, um, Last year, we did 80 um, out of all of our adoptions, 80% were done by foster parents. Yeah, so it's a high stat. That's amazing. Uh, mm -hmm. So, on average, there's approximately just under 13,000 children in youth in care. That's also coming down as well because there's a focus, a very strong focus on kinship care and um, we're always looking for relations for the child. And kinship is not just. Um, blood related this is um it could be a neighbor it could be um a coach it could be a teacher um it those are it could be the best friends parents that can care for the child so kinship is a is a wide continuum of what that means and so that's what we're doing in child protection is we're looking for those connections for children and those kin relations perfect mm -hmm. So how do we um, prepare children? Well, there's many ways we can prepare them. Um, it's always through the one-to-one -one relationship. That really is that special bond that we have. And once the child, um, once we have established that reciprocal trust, um, then um, it's, it's um, wonderful how the child will just blossom and then start to truly um, talk about some wishes that they've had that might be they might have been fearful to express before um, and they really learn to trust and start moving along the process of thinking yeah you know what I'd really like um, uh, you know a parent who has a, or a, a foster 
sorry, I really like an adoptive home with a dog or someone that lives out in the county or, and they start really thinking seriously about it. And, you know, it's, they're, the hope is there. And, and I see that grow. But uh, we help them pre prepare for um, adoption as well through helping their, their team, their childcare team. You know, we talk to the foster parents um, and um, therapists and could be OTs or PTs or teachers or principals. We uh, help them all um, support the child and use the same language. Um, and so we want the child to feel free to talk to anybody, any adults in their life about it and help them through this process. Um, so that's how we prepare them. We use a life book. Every child in care has a life book. And they can put their information in there and their pictures. And sometimes we'll get them cameras um, to take um, pictures of, like, they're going, um, say, to the Tim Hortons camp. We'll give them a, a little camera so they can take pictures and then add it to their life book. And um, their foster parents will add to it. We put pictures of the birth family in there. So um, these books are really important um, in order to help the child move on to adoption. Um, it, they can move, they can uh, start their next chapter in, the, in their adoptive home. So we find that um, helping them develop a life book is really important. And, it's, and as an adoptive parent who has her children's life book, it's something that we really cherish as well. And we look through it often. It helped us explain more about their journey and be able to reminisce on on where they've come from and I know having having pictures of our children before they came to us and, and being able to celebrate the milestones with them was is just amazing I think our, our oldest serenity like her first foster parent must have been like mini Martha Stewart's because they had scrapbooked this thing to the nine so it was just really beautiful and it's something that we kind of keep and we're going to hold on to for the rest of rest of their lives really because it's um it was really amazing to see and so yeah, yeah I think if any adoptive parent um are able to to request that or or support them and we continue it on so as the child children transition into our home and as we have milestones we've been adding to it ourselves it's not as good <laughs> I'm not as, as as crafty um but we try so that it really helps develop um their their journey and their story so yeah it's something I I, I really love that's excellent. And the one other thing just here is that I, I think is really important is that um, giving the child permission to love more than one mom or um, one dad, um, it's really giving them that permission because of that loyalty that they um, naturally, innately have to their birth family. Um, we respect that, we honor that, um, and then we give them permission to love more than one, one mom or dad. Absolutely, that's really important in, through my practice um, that. Um, I, I think is pivotal. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have someone who commented for older youth, we started doing life books on a PowerPoint and they've really responded. Oh, that's a smart idea. PowerPoint. Actually, that's really funny because Priscilla, you were giving me PowerPoint tips <laughs> <laughs> when we were developing this and I was like, oh, what am I doing? <laughs> yeah. So that's a really smart idea because kids are so tight. Even my six year old, he can program his iPad better than I can sometimes. <laughs> scary because it kind of feels like it's starting to date me but oh, it's no it's very true yeah that's a great point because children they're they're so tech savvy and in for them to engage in that process and you know there might not be crafty kids right everyone has their own niche and so if it's uh into if they're into that kind of techie kind of mindset then that's a great way to engage them i agree and i see we have another dog uh that's come to join <laughs> <laughs> you know, you guys had more than one dog. It was awesome. So uh, we had Spider Man pop up. My son threw Spider Man over here. Oh, hi, Poochie. <laughs> so, just really for, um, yeah, did you want to talk, Valerie? Did you? Um, yes, I think we had talked about you guys that? trying to provide some insights in this area because I know you, you obviously have this lived experience. So, we were chatting about that. Do you guys mind kind of talking? I don't know necessarily reading through the slides, but even just kind of sharing your, your thoughts. Okay, um, so for start here. <laughs> so for openness, um, we do um, have openness with a sibling, and uh, and we're at the point where we set that up with, 
his foster parents. He comes and stays with us overnight or we have day visits or sometimes Priscilla goes there. Um, and it's really important. Maybe you can yes. explain why. <laughs> um, like just because like, um, like, um, I don't know, like it's, I feel like it's just important to maintain that relationship. Um, just like in terms of like, like even though like, like a child might not be connected to their parents, they're at least connected to their siblings so that they like at least have like some like blood in the relation and like their life. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, like it's, a link to the, it's a link to the past, and it means uh, I think you know Priscilla feels protective as well. It means that they can maintain a relationship into the future as well. Um, then, so for loyalty and patience and learning through mistakes, <laughs> we've done lots of that. Haven't we? <laughs> um, you have a lot of expectations. I think you know Priscilla did. I did. Um, everyone does going into adoption and you have to be very flexible um, once things get rolling and once the movement has happened. Um, <laughs> you can blame in this case. <laughs> I'm um, very excited about tonight's webinar, clearly we can tell. Yeah, yeah you, have to be, you have to be prepared to, um, to adapt your expectations and to, to love the child who's there and the parent who's there. And um, kind of let go of whatever fantasy <laughs> you had before. Yeah. And often the person who's there, you know, there, there's so many things that uh, you didn't expect that are quite amazing. So, you know, what, you lose some of the fantasy, but you gain all these extra things you weren't expecting. But like, also, don't come in with, like, by fantasizing about how you want your family to be and like. You know, like, don't do that because, like, you're, most of the time you're just going to let yourself down because, like, obviously, like, um, especially for teens, this is someone who's been through a lot of trauma and uh, been with, like, for also teens that have been, like, moving from home to home, they've been through, like, many parenting um, styles and many different environments. So, like... I, I recommend you just rather not come in with like, like, um, too many expectations. Yeah, expect yeah. <laughs> too many expectations, yeah. Um, in terms of independence and belonging and attaching, um, I think the older a child is, uh, the more it's possible that they've, they've built a wall around their feelings or they've been stealing themselves. Uh, for independent life. Um, we've met some, some teens who were told mm, as soon as they entered their teen years, you know, you're, you're going to be on your own. <laughs> you better start learning to do your laundry and, um, and cook and things like that. So I think that if that's been your expectation and then suddenly you're plumped into a family and, you know, back into the child role, it's it's a little bit hard to mm -hmm. to let go and to lean on somebody else, and so you can't really rush that part of the relationship. You yeah. Have to yeah. So like a tip could be to like um, like because for like I was talking to my mom about this, and she mentioned that like I did have like a little bit of like like well I had an independent mindset just because of how old I was. Um, um so like just in terms of um like accepting the fact that like that is going to happen and that like you know like try to like find like ways to easily transition them into you know like they're a lot they can be independent but then also letting them know that there are some things where you know like just in in terms of where they like how old they are like they can't handle by themselves so just having that support there is mm -hmm. is, is good <laughs> um so fear of projection and abandonment like that's a pretty big thing yeah. It? <laughs> it is, it is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anytime that you know something small happened i think that for a child who's who's often been moved around between families um that can trigger that fear that this is this is the end so um, you know, you have to be patient with that and try and um, 
you know, try and bring down those feelings of fear and reassure the child who's moving in with you that yeah. this is permanent and this is you this know, is real. Like and like we can like even if like a big argument or disagreement does come up, like um like just make sure to like always re like reassure them and say that we'll we will get through this and I won't call your worker so that you have to go, you won't have to move out, like you know, this is how like families are like and um, like, you know, like even people that are living with their biological parents, like they go through this too, mm -hmm. so just reassuring them that like, you know, don't worry, I won't kick you out or mm -hmm. anything like that. Like I won't neglect you or anything it is like very helpful. Um, in terms of ambivalence, um, <laughs> it's, what, it's how you felt for the first few months. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, when Priscilla first moved in, after a couple of days, she's like, I'm not sure about this whole yeah. thing. I'm not getting a mom vibe from you. <laughs> and she was talking about moving back to her old foster placement. So <laughs> I was like, just give it a little bit of time and it's normal like you're yeah. not gonna feel I'm not gonna feel like your mom like instantly, instantly. Yeah. um mm -hmm. and and you know and for parents as well like it takes time to to develop those feelings so you just um I, I think at the beginning you you make your priority making the child who's moved in with you feel feel safe and wanted and loved and all their needs are met um without crowding them too much mm -hmm. and then it, um, a friend who had also adopted uh, she spoke to me about this and she said you know you'll go through a few things together and it'll switch from from like niggling little fights with each other to you two against the world and mm -hmm. and that's kind of what happens just life happens you know there's there's a teacher who your kid's angry with or there's maybe your kid gets sick and they need to be looked after and so you just have to like give things time and it's always at the most surprising moments that the bonding happens covered flexible expectations as well yeah yeah absolutely oh there's <laughs> more okay you uh, thought you were done not quite <laughs> <laughs> and we honestly need to go point by point as well yeah. just, just trying to be mindful of time is there anything that really uh, pops out to you guys that you think would be important to I know we talked about in our pre-planning the food food in that diet for some children not necessarily in your for your situation but for some children that could be a big trigger yeah. um, and then maybe after you maybe Talk, want to talk about a couple of things um i can also or you can also comment on social media because i know especially for teens or for anyone really that's a huge part and um later on we also talk about openness and how social media comes into play to that um but i think it's really important for for families to prepare that this is a, a way that family and that, that youth are going to be engaging and connecting right so I don't know if there's anything that you guys wanted to um, specifically talk about here, but. Okay, well, you go um, first. Well, in terms of um, like creating new traditions or rituals, um, like for me, um, like I personally didn't want, like I was very um, close with my first foster home, um, first foster family. So I didn't really want to have, um, like the same traditions as them because it just really reminded me of of them and it's something that I wanted to just keep especially for them um like um so like just in terms of that um like I'm not sure how many kids are like that also but it would be cool if like um like you and your child had like oh the one thing that you like you two always did together mm -hmm. and stuff because like then it like it I think that's how like um the bond like um increases and um like the relationship also like grows more um and they feel connected to you like in their own special way so yeah um I so I think that first point as well the structure oh. as mm -hmm. a means of safety um 
I think that a lot of kids who've had a lot of change they feel anxious about what's coming next, what's coming next. And when it's a new family situation, um, it could be completely different to what you're used to. So um, I don't know if you noticed this. <laughs> in the first few weeks and months, if we were, if the weekend was coming up, we'd always, I'd always say, okay, you know, on Saturday we're doing this, and then in the afternoon we're doing this. And so that um, we try to make things as predictable as possible for Priscilla. Um, and I've also heard from a lot of other uh, parents of older kids that trying not to cram too much in is really important as well. So keeping the day simple and um, that way it's not like it's not overload for mm -hmm. a child when they're getting used to everything else. Right. Yeah. So like also just to add on, like giving them a chance to have some downtime also, because mm -hmm. I think like that's needed, especially if the day was like maybe just a little bit busier than usual, just giving that them that time to de-stress because like, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> or, yeah. It's true, and I think as adoptive, adoptive parents, and I can relate from my experience that I was just so excited to be a parent um, that I wanted to introduce my kids to the world, and it can be pretty <laughs> overstimulating and overwhelming. So I think just, just in hearing your insight, Priscilla, it's just really, allowing your child to take the lead as much as possible um, mm -hmm. in, in listening to them. And sometimes that might come out as, and, and hopefully because uh, your children are older, it, you actually might be able to have a, that conversation where they might be able to identify what their needs might be. But for some, sometimes it could come out as behaviors or as mm -hmm. um, you'll see triggers in other ways that might come out. And I found that Again, my children aren't older, but I found that my kids were able to communicate to me in different ways. So I think listening to, to what they're saying, what they're not saying, what their bodies are saying, I think is a huge, a huge part of it. Mm -hmm. And I think that almost kind of ties into that age continuum that we had chatted about when we were planning it is that a lot of children, although developmentally um, or chronologically, sorry, they might be coming into your home at a certain age. Developmentally, they might still have some needs. And although perhaps um, cognitively, they might be able to speak and think like a teenager, but emotionally, because of certain needs, they might respond in a younger way. So I think that it's also important to know that when you're learning to, to develop that relationship and, and the bond and, and respond to your child's needs, that you're responding in a way that meets their needs developmentally. Mm -hmm. would, you, would you guys agree with that? Do you think that's, that's yeah. fair? Okay. And I, we just have a question that popped up as well. Um, talk about next steps with the youth before you take. Yes, absolutely. Talking about the next steps with the youth, making sure that they are involved in, in the decisions, the whole, the whole way I think is, is huge. Mm -hmm. I think for, for me as the recruiter, um, that's one thing that we always honor, that children lead the adoption. Um, they are part, they're, they're the ones that lead, they're the ones that make, that will make the decisions. Um, and we're, we're there to help guide them and provide information and support them in that. But absolutely, um, they yeah. take the lead. The adoption probation period, I think the minimum it can be is six months, but yeah. our worker told us that typically um, with older youth, it's going to be a year or a little bit longer. And like for us, we wanted to go to court and sign the papers and be like really celebrating that day. Uh, so, you know, it was important not to rush to that point. Um, and so, yeah, so by the time we get there, it will be just over a year, mm -hmm. uh, probably. And that felt good for us. So now we feel like we can throw a party, but if we then after six months. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, no. Um, yeah, like, cause like, obviously there were some uh, like ups and downs and I'm glad that we like Susan, um, our worker did tell us to wait. Um, yeah. And like, you know, just, yeah. So. Absolutely. And we do have a comment that just popped up saying, thank you, Priscilla, for coming and talking. You are so brave and awesome. I completely agree. Um, so this family has four teens um, with them right now. And the 15 year old often acts like he doesn't want to be with us. So I'm listening to what you said. So thank you again. Yeah. Yay! That's the reason why we wanted to do this webinar. <laughs> I'm so happy. Amazing feedback. So again, I just want to be cognizant of time because we have just just about a half hour, so I might we might have to power through some slides because I want to make sure that we have enough time. 
to touch on everything and that there's still time for you guys to kind of share a little bit more. So if you're okay, Darcy, I might um, bump up some slides. Is that okay? Yeah, go ahead. There's some videos um, yeah. from the Dave Thomas Foundation. Um, just when you, if you look, you can go on YouTube afterwards and, and, and view them. Um, but yeah, when you have a moment, just check out the videos. Um, and I'll make sure to link them in the email that I send because I think okay. this is really important information. So for those of you who are viewing, if we are kind of going through a slide faster than you're hoping, please feel free to reach out to us afterwards and we're more than happy to connect and speak with you. We just want to make sure that we're, we're getting as much as possible out of this. I know it's a big topic, um, but I want to make sure, especially that we hear from Valerie and Priscilla because I think that... Um, it's a lot of great information that we need to hear. So let me move on. That being said, I'm going to move on. Um, I think this is okay if we just kind of skim through. Well, this is more of like a fun. This is a really great. As someone who adopted children with formulas and diapers, uh, <laughs> I can appreciate how great it would be to not to kind of skip that stage as well. But um, there are absolute benefits. I think this is just the main point of the slide. There are absolute benefits um, to adopting a child who is older. Um, and this is just list some of them. Uh, this is one of the links that I will send and keep on into the email if everyone's okay with that. Um, Again, with this one, I'll make sure that everybody has a copy of this one. I send out the email. If you are watching this on the recording, um, please feel free um, to connect with me personally uh, as well. And I'm more than happy to share these resources with you. Yeah, this, this slide is just about the act, the new act that um, we spoke about already. But the one thing I want you to know here is that we do have 48 children's aid societies in Ontario and the four um, Aboriginal child welfare agencies just so it's a little bit of uh, knowledge for you. Absolutely. And the new CYFSA does, is going to have a big impact on adoptions. Um, so for those of you who are, who are awaiting parents or who are looking into adoption and considering it, just know that that might mean something different uh, in that the, the implementation, implementation of this new act uh, really serves to, to support families and to support children more specifically to make sure that um, their needs are met and we're going to discuss I think a little bit about openness and what the changes are um, yeah. and it really does it does strengthen those provisions for um, um, our adoptive families absolutely so I think this is important so do you mind Darcy yeah. chatting a little bit about because I think this is a really big point yeah it is it is really important and, and you need to know about um, the child's um, consent in Ontario um, the child when a child's seven years of age they have to consent to their adoption um, so they will have a, a lawyer assigned to them, their own individual um, lawyer. If it's a sibling group, they will each have their own lawyer as well, separate lawyers to represent them. That's usually the practice. Um, and so for openness, and uh, usually with our older youth, um, there is an openness order or agreement. But when it's an order, um, the child um, will have to speak to that openness piece. Um, and um, that could be about an openness with anybody, but particularly it's usually the ones with access. Um, it's, it's with the person that has an access order to the extended society care. Um, so it could be a, a, a birth parent. Yeah. Can we just speak to this? Um, so uh, having spoken with other parents going through the process of finalizing uh, the children's lawyer part can be quite intimidating for kids and uh, they, they go in by themselves with the lawyer so they're they're hearing about a lot of big things that are going to happen and maybe not fully understanding everything so one thing the parents can do in advance is call the lawyer's office and ask what are you guys going to discuss and then you know, be next door and your kids ask if they can come out for a break or a hug if it's, if it's getting overwhelming and yeah. prepare them before they go in. That's a, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Priscilla. Is the child uh, participating in like, like, they have like someone beside them? Oh, that's true, yes. Yeah, so um, um, another thing me and my mom chatted about in terms of like meeting with the children's lawyer, um, like um, if like, if, like your child is at an age where like it might be challenging for them to understand so like seven years or to mm -hmm. like 10 or like 12 or something um like 
recommended would be like a child advocacy um, like worker who um, like just sits with them during the like the whole meeting with the um, with the like um, with the lawyer and to just um, let them like explain like things that like the child doesn't understand. Um, I don't know. <laughs> and I know that um, as an adoptive parent, just blankly hearing that a child age seven mm-hmm. and up need to consent, it can be a very scary thing to just read blankly. So from my understanding, and please everyone jump in if, if I'm speaking out of turn, but for a child to consent to the adoption, um, there's also years of conversations that happen beforehand. So this shouldn't, is, is the important word, this shouldn't be um, a new concept that no. is brought up. So the child should have been aware from the get-go that this was the plan uh, and the child should have had, should have a voice and be able to be a part of that process from the beginning. So absolutely, when I first learned that a child seven age must consent to the adoption, it can be overwhelming to hear that. That being said, um, it, it isn't something that, that's going to just kind of pop up out of nowhere. Is that, is that kind of fair to say? Absolutely. Uh, sorry, just from my end as a child protection um, <clears throat> worker and a WWK worker, you're right. The child, we talk about adoption. We talk about the plan. When a child, um, when, when the OCL is involved and they have to consent, they know like they, they are there. Um, they, the transition, the dis- they're part of the whole process. So they, they know where they're um, going and what the plan is. And, um, and that's when they consent to it. And they still have a, a you know, there's, there's still time scales that children can change their mind. Um, and it's really about OCL, um, having that expertise and that experience um, to work and help children understand from a legal sense what adoption means, because they have to know what legally what that means. Um, with their name and, um, and inheritance rights, things like that. They, they will, and they will also, they also had some new training this year, um, from my understanding. And um, so it, there's a lot more engagement um, when, when um, the, this process happens, and especially when it's around openness. There's, um, there could be multiple visits with a lawyer. And um, I think they go into a lot deeper conversations, maybe than historical. Um, historically, but um, I think that there's a different emphasis now on that relationship and the information that's shared. Absolutely, and, and as far as um, Adopt for Life and the supports we provide, is we're able to support families through this process as well. So, if you are a new family who's recently matched, who whose child is is potentially meeting with their OCL lawyer, and you want to connect with other families who've been through it, or perhaps you want your child to connect with other children who've been through there, that's something that we're able to, to do. Um, and I know that uh, for some children, and, and we have, and we are supporting families who children have decided that they don't want to be adopted for various reasons. And for sometimes for those families, it's, it's just about redefining what permanency and family means for them. So in some cases, um, children have decided that they do not want to pursue formal adoption, but there's still a relationship. So what family might look like for them could be a little bit different. So in these cases, it's, it's just about being able to understand and how to support children and, and how to redefine what your role might be in the child's life as well. Mm-hmm. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there as well. Okay, let's move on to make sure that we have all this information. Okay, so I know there are specific skills and strengths that you guys look for uh, in a family. We do have about 15 minutes left or so. So is it okay if we just kind of leave this up for a couple minutes? Is there any specific points that you think is important? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, for developmental trauma. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think that developmental trauma um, is the most important thing there. And it can show up in all different shapes and forms. And it might look like some other mental health diagnosis or some other physical diagnosis for some kids. Um, So learn as much as you can about that. Mm -hmm. Expect it. Um, And make sure that the medical professionals who are working with your kids know what it is so that your child is not misdiagnosed. 
Yeah, and um, there's uh, so I did the Pathways course after Adult Time Priscilla, and it's really the best thing that I could have done as a new adoptive parent. Um, I learned all about how to respond to to different behaviors that come out of trauma, how to understand Priscilla better, how to communicate with her. And also, um, in the meantime, Priscilla was working in the, the child care center volunteering. So she met all the other kids who were recently adopted and, um, and some older peer mentors. And then I met all these parents, some of whom I've stayed in contact with and they've become you know, we've, we've become quite tight and supported each other and celebrated all the good stuff together as well. And for those who might not know, Pathways is it's a free program, which is amazing. And you get dinner, like, it doesn't get any better. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest, you get a dinner. And health bars for the parents, <laughs> just depending on who actually approves of it. <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> um, and it's, I think it's an eight week course. I could be wrong. Um, it's run through the Adoption Council of Ontario and it's throughout uh, different cities uh, within the province of Ontario. So what I'll do as well, because I also took it and it's a fantastic fantastic uh, game changer as far as I'm concerned. I'll make sure to link the uh, listings of all the Pathways courses. Um, and if you don't find your city listed, please email the ACO um, because they keep track of who and what city people are wanting to support. So yeah, it's absolutely fantastic. So Darcy, do you have any other points for the slide that you think are important? Well, I just wanted to say a little bit more about developmental trauma and I'm really glad that you raised that, um, Priscilla and Valerie. Um, the ACO, the Adoption Council of Ontario, there's the um, Developmental Trauma Action Alliance right now, and um, they have a, there's a lot of research and um, information on the site that you can um, you know uh, download or print off and read because it is um, you know you need to make sure that when like doctors and teachers and um, you know whoever's involved in a child's life that they really look through the lens of de developmental trauma for um, our children, um, because I think that uh, it, it, it's a, it means a lot and it, it has to be um, acknowledged. Um, the, yeah, it, it, the, the last point about foster with a view to adopt, that's really important. Um, a lot of the different agencies will use that. Um, where, so, and that's really just to um, work through openness orders sometimes. And other times it's just really to provide a lot of supports to the family in the beginning before you move to the um, adoption probation period. Um, and, and like Valerie said, it has to be uh, six months before a judge can even hear um, for finalization of the adoption. But you can actually go on parental leave um, as soon as you start fostering because the goal is adoption. So that allows you to speak, be at home, start the attachment cycle, and really invest your whole time in this process and the transition. And that's actually what we did with all three of our kids. So if anyone wants to connect um, about that, please feel free to reach out to me personally as well, because there's uh, pros and cons to everything. So I'm more than happy to share uh, our personal experience. Sorry, Valerie, you were talking and I cut you off. Sorry. <laughs> I just, I want to say for parental leave, um, one of my biggest regrets is uh, assuming that because I was adopting an older child, I didn't need parental leave or I didn't need a long parental leave because she's going to be in school. And, you know, I just kind of thought we'd hit the ground running. Um, and even though you're not changing diapers and getting up in the middle of the night, although you might be, <laughs> not, with, not in Priscilla's case, um, it's just like it, it's such a huge life change for everybody. You're, you're all very freaked out and emotionally overwhelmed. And, um, and you also want to spend a lot of time together. Like we, the last year and a half, we really spent a lot of time together. And that's, um, that's been so important for us to bond. So if you're going to work and you're coming home tired, um, which I was doing after three months, it just makes it that much harder. So like take the adoption seriously, make sure your employer takes it seriously. Hi, mom. <laughs> take your parental leave. <laughs> mm -hmm. and just, I just wanted to go back quickly to the developmental trauma piece. So uh, right now, Adopt for Life, we're actually doing a campaign on developmental trauma. So if anyone is interested in getting more resources, uh, we have weekly blogs about families who are raising children who have developmental trauma as well. So we're trying to share as much information 
resources, supports out there. So if anyone's interested, please feel free to uh, follow our public um, Facebook page, Adopt for Life, uh, and you'll be able to get a bit more information about that as well. Okay, I, we're going to have to skip a couple slides, unfortunately, yeah. because we have 10 minutes. And I want to give that to you guys, Valerie and Priscilla, if that's okay. So I'm going to very slowly go through these slides so everyone can read them. I can summarize this one really quickly. Um, there are financial supports in the province for um, older adoptions and for sibling adoptions. You have There's information there where um, if you make combined income, um, net income, um, under 93.7 that you would be eligible if you adopt a child um, over the age of eight or a sibling group and you would be um, eligible for just over a thousand dollars a month per child up until the child is 21. And if you um, are looking at legal custody, which is another wonderful permanency plan for our children, um, you can also um, tap into the continued care support for youth program at the Children's Aid Societies. And I can provide you with information about what that means and what those programs are. Perfect. And just for dependents. I know that the net income can be confusing for some people, uh, including myself. So uh, what they look at is line 236 on your income tax in case you wanted to see if that's something you would be eligible for. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. <laughs> I know like stuff kind of is goes over my head, so I just want to throw it out there. Okay, I really wish we didn't have to go over openness um, very quickly, but um, very quickly to touch. It's just really to know that older children uh, who, who will be coming into your home have those connections. They have a right to these connections. They're going to have a voice. I know Valerie and Priscilla, I'm sure you have a lot more to say on this than I can, but it's really just to know there are the new, the new act is really meant to um, honor um, children and give them rights to these connections and really to show that um, open adoptions is, is um, where a lot of adoptions is where the movement seems to be going there's there's very limited closed adoptions nowadays and especially for older youth it is something that is extremely important which I mean I'm I, I'm sure I don't need to say that to all of us here openness is extremely important in in just knowing that if you are pursuing older youth adoption or any adoption to have an open heart and an open mind for openness and to realize that it's okay to, to be a little bit scared and overwhelmed as an adoptive parent, but to respect that this is the child's journey and this is their relationships and you really need to um, honor that. I hope I'm making, I hope I'm, I, I gave that enough. <laughs> so, and, and again, if you need support with openness, that is something that you can reach out to the ACO, to Adopt for Life, to your workers to make sure that you understand, first understand your rights, but also to know where you can go to get that support in developing those relationships yourself. Okay, I'm going to, so this is just more about openness. Yeah. Um, openness agreements and orders, those are something that you can discuss with your worker um, to make sure you understand what they are. I think I talked about Adopt for Life a lot. Uh, I hope there's a good understanding about who we are. Um, we provide supports to families throughout their entire journey, whether you're an awaiting parent, all the way up to being a parent for 50 plus years, we're there to help support you. And we wanna make sure that the information is going out there and that really to help um, abolish the isolation that can happen by those who are touched by adoption. Um, so we just wanted to share that we do provide that ongoing support. Um, we refer to a lot of families and a lot of their outside resources. Um, so if you are looking for um, adoption competent supports, if you're looking for a specific training like we talked about with the ACO, we refer all of our families to Pathways because we, we know how important that is. Um, so please feel free to um, connect with us. Okay. You, you guys have about 10 minutes, if that's okay. So I know that um, you guys had provided a few kind of tips, and I, I don't know why it didn't get into the slide very well, but if you guys wanted to just kind of share, if you could provide your three sort of tips that you can provide to awaiting parents, and hopefully do it in 10 minutes, that would be perfect. I would, do you think we should just go over to questions if we just have 10 minutes left yeah, and people yeah. can... Sure, if you want to do that, and maybe as we're waiting for the questions yeah. to come in, you guys can chat as well. This has come up already in yeah. our other points. <laughs> also, like, if you'd like, you can take a photo really quickly, or if you're watching on your phone, take a screenshot. If you don't know how to do it, 
You just press the power button and the home button at the same time. <laughs> See? Yes, I told you. <laughs> so does anybody have any pressing questions? Does anybody feel that something wasn't covered or do you have a specific situation with your family that you'd love some insight from, from Priscilla or from Valerie for any of us really, uh, please feel free um, to, to have the floor is yours for the next few minutes. And um, we tend to usually run over by one or two minutes, but I just want to be respectful of everybody's time. And Darcy, I know that you have potential of being locked out of your, <laughs> of your building. So want to make sure that you can get home as well. Thank you. Um, so the question is, are there financial supports available for things like occupational therapists, language therapy, et cetera, if a family doesn't meet the, the requirements for the previous slide? Okay, that's a really good question. Um, it all is based on the needs of the child. So it, it all depends on your children's aid society, um, but definitely you need to feel conf confident to ask that question. Um, we would ask, um, is it available in the community? Is it available through the schools? Um, do you have your benefits pa um, packaged? Is there any resources that you can utilize through your benefits? Um, and if not, then it's a discussion definitely that we would have. Um, we know the needs of the children. We need we want to make this adoption successful, so we're gonna put the resources in place. Um, we're also gonna to look to our partners, like Adopt for Life and Adoption Council of Ontario, um, to see how we can all support um, them. But we, there's potential funding if you ask, and um, there's an identified need, there should be. But it's an individual case-by-case um, -case situation. And if there is an identified or diagnosed disability or identified need, um, there's also potential for ministry funding outside of adoption fields. So things like special services at home, the disability tax credit, those are things that you may be eligible to apply for. If you're wondering if your family is eligible, please feel free to reach out um, to your caseworker or to us at Adopt for Life, the ACO, because we'll be able to help support you through that just to see if those are options, because I do know a lot of families have accessed that, the funding support, myself included, um, to just ensure that our families are well and our kids are getting the support they need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any more questions? Let's see. Oh, oh, we're <laughs> popping up. <laughs> the magic words, as soon as you said it, it popped up. So this is for you specifically, Priscilla. So our 15 year old foster child keeps saying that he can take care of himself when he's showing that he can't and keeps pushing us away even though we treat him very well do you have any suggestions for us okay that's a good question um just to, like i don't know like the first thing that popped into my head was don't make it obvious that you're taking care of him <laughs> because then it's like no i can do it myself right just kind of like slip in and be like don't say okay let me help you <laughs> like don't say the word help because <laughs> afterwards he's gonna be like no i i can take care of myself you know so mm -hmm. I, I don't know whether that helps but i mean well, I think that's helpful yeah. what do you think <laughs> mm -hmm. and then the pushing away i think that's that's also really normal and yeah it's it's an adoption thing it's also a a team thing like you are trying to figure out what you can do for yourself and sometimes you can do more than your parents think you can do right um but yeah like i i think especially the early months there was a lot of push and pull yeah and push and i was pull like and, that too so. <laughs> <laughs> and um so i just you know i tried to make sure that um and i have a, a son who's 24 as well so i've been through the teen years once trying mm -hmm. to make sure that you're just around you know yeah. you're maybe not um super engaging if the kids needs their space but you're in the kitchen cooking you're not you know out every night so that if they need you they will find you yeah i think yeah perfect and is there any like i know i'm just cognizant of time i don't want you to be locked out darcy um yeah. is there any last questions uh that anyone can think of just as we wrap up please know that if after this webinar, you come up with the most brilliant question that you forgot to ask. It's so accessible. So please, I know Valerie's email, so don't worry. <laughs> so please feel free to reach out if you're finding afterwards that there's questions that you may have. If you're going to the ARA, we will be there as well. So please feel free to um, you come and chat us up. Exactly. So is there any last question that we see popping up? I don't see it. Okay, so at this point, I am going to um, 
stop the video. I'm going to stop recording. Um, and I also wanted to.